25th of April, 2015, I was on a rest day on my Everest expedition. We had spent almost a month trekking and hiking and climbing in the neighborhood around Everest, adapting our bodies to the altitude and conditioning ourselves for a long month that lay ahead. At midnight, we had planned to climb through the Kumbu Icefall to Camp 1, then on to Camp 2 for a few days and circle back to base camp on our first rotation up the mountain. It would be another 25 days before we would see the summit, but everything was going great. Everest was in fact the culmination of my Seven Summits challenge, to climb the highest peaks in all seven continents. I'd actually managed to complete six of them, so this was the last one. But it wasn't my first time to Everest. I'd been there the previous year, and our expedition had ended abruptly when a massive avalanche tore down the icefall and killed 16 Sherpa. I was now back a year later, hoping to finally finish that seventh summit. The road to this point was really a decade-long journey to gain the skills and know-how necessary to have a shot at the big one. And that journey took me from the top of Kilimanjaro in Africa, to Elbrus in Russia, to Denali in Alaska, to almost 7,000 meters on Aconcagua in Argentina, and to the amazing slopes of Vincent Massif in Antarctica. Yes, mountains in Antarctica. It also included a lot of training climbs all over the world, and I'd wrestled my fears to the ground over a decade of progressive effort. But preparing for Everest is, is very different. The top of the mountain sits just above 29,000 feet, and the whole last phase of your climb is in a zone where humans can't adapt, so you're essentially dying. And so the whole climb becomes an effort to try and get up the mountain very, very slowly so that you adapt, find the perfect weather window to punch through, get up and get back down before you do any physiological damage to yourself. And so I threw myself into very intense training over two years. I moved into an altitude house to live. I trained every muscle and movement. I tested everything from crampons and the aluminium ladders through to my reactions and responsiveness after exhausting myself running in an altitude gym. It's, uh, it's tough going trying to train for something like this, but I felt I'd covered most of my bases. And I'm an aerospace engineer, so I like to plan. And so I assessed the mountain to look at the terrain from top to bottom. I even analyzed fatalities to see where people got in trouble and why. And I thought I'd covered most bases. What had happened the previous year on the ice fall in 2014 <coughs> had become the worst disaster in the history of Everest. And it seemed the chances of another major disaster happening so soon again seemed statistically small. But on that April morning on our rest day, the ground started moving under me, and everything was about to change. Now let's go back in time for a moment, because what was happening had its origins 50 million years before, when the Indian tectonic plate smashed into the Eurasian plate to create the Himalayas. The Indian plate continues to move north a little bit every year, causing pressure to build up. And at 11.56 a.m. that morning, some of that pressure released when a fault ruptured 10 miles underground. So under our feet, the power of 500 Hiroshimas had just unleashed. And it started with a gentle swaying, then a more violent movement, and it was accompanied by a very deep rumbling noise. Now, we're used to rumblings. There's lots of little avalanches throughout the Everest season on various peaks, but this was different. And the entire Kumbu glacier on which base camp sits was on the move. It was pretty difficult to realize and rationalize what was going on. It sounded like an earthquake, but it felt totally different. And in that word that had never entered my planning or preparation even once, earthquake. We had been stood transfixed by the ice fall, quite honestly, for fear that it might collapse on top of us. But behind us and many miles away, a large amount of ice and snow had detached from on top of a different mountain smashed onto the plateau below, and it triggered a shockwave which headed straight for base camp, and it picked up everything in its path. By the time we saw it, it was almost on top of us. Our confusion had now given way to panic, 
I had been doing some recording with my camera when the quake hit, and I swung the camera around just as I was about to run to capture what was coming at us. Our nearest refuge or safety was our mess tent, so we jumped inside, we got onto the table, and we zipped the door shut. In retrospect, it wasn't the greatest plan in the world because there we were crouched inside a plastic bag underneath some plastic garden furniture in the middle of our Everest expedition, in the middle of one of the biggest earthquakes the country's ever seen, with an avalanche about to slam into us. So pretty fair to say that it wasn't exactly going to plan. And that's when the next stage of fear kicks in, waiting for impact. When you know something bad is going to happen, you try and guard yourself against it. You make a decision to do something. And once that decision is made, you're left alone with your imagination. And for a small cohort at base camp, that imagination was a bit more vivid because we'd witnessed the aftermath of the avalanche and the ice fall in 2014. We'd heard the reports from the scene. We saw the effect and impact it had on the Sherpa and the wider community. It was very, very real. Some of the Sherpa have never been found. And it was hard not to think about that as the avalanche rumbled towards us. I could hear some praying on the other side of the tent. And as the noise got louder and louder, the tent started to shake violently. It seemed to last for an eternity, but in reality, after a couple of minutes, it had all died down. The shockwave had lost most of its energy by the time it reached us. We got lucky. It took a few minutes for radios to start crackling, and we realized people were in trouble. We knew there was a lot of teams up at Camp 1 and Camp 2 who had already started their rotation. And my first thought was, the problem must be up high, because Camp 1 is a known avalanche risk, and Camp 2 sits at the end of the Western Coombe, which is riddled with crevasses. But as we ventured out into base camp, we very quickly realized the chaos was in our own backyard. Initially, we saw some clamp climbing gear and, and some sleeping bags strewn about the place. Then entire tents torn to shreds, debris where camps had once been. The shockwave had effectively obliterated the whole middle of base camp. Incredibly, the medical tent at the center had survived. And when we reached it, the medical team were in full flow. You didn't have to look very far around you to realize how serious things had gotten. So trying to hide our fear, we walked up to the doctor and simply said, what do you need? And along with a lot of other people, we spent that day carrying badly injured people across the rough terrain at base camp to the entrance on the far side. Because if there was going to be any evacuation, that's where it would happen. And so. Carrying people across base camp at altitude is easier said than done. It's quite exhausting, the terrain is very difficult, and the visibility was very, very poor. By now, a kind of a triage system had been set up at base camp where the walking wounded would go to one camp and the seriously injured had to be carried to a different one. And expedition leaders were standing on rocks along the way, kind of trying to direct the flow of traffic, communicating about the casualties back to the tents. And some of the bigger tents on the entrance to base camp had effectively now become a treatment center. And as the day wore on, you start to become very aware of what has actually happened. 19 people were dead. More than 60 people were injured, some very, very seriously. And a lot of people were stuck between camp one and camp two, absolutely terrorized. I called home on the sat phone just to let my family know that I was okay. But the communications generally were poor. We were hearing rumors about a bigger earthquake on the way. But what was clear was that the visibility was too poor for the helicopters to reach us, so evacuation was at least a day away. By nightfall, all of the wounded had been transferred across to the entrance of camp and were being treated by a mixture of medics and climbers with medical background. We regrouped with our Sherpa and with our team to try and figure out how to deal with the night ahead and what came after. The instruction was simple. Sleep with your helmet on and your boots on. If you hear anything or feel anything during the night, get out of your tent, stay low, try and figure out what direction it's coming from, and take cover. Next morning, I crossed to the other side of base camp to try and make myself useful. And by the time I got across there, the evacuations had already started to begin.
The helicopter had landed and the seriously wounded were being ferried down to Kathmandu for treatment. The weather had played ball and there was a very tangible sense of relief, especially among the medics and the folks who had spent the night treating the very seriously injured. I had just got back to my tent later that morning when I felt movement again. It was the aftershock. We knew it was coming. And let's face it, we had a day of experience to contemplate what it might bring. It didn't last very long, but it injected fresh terror into the muscle memory, some of which exists to this day. As morning gave way to afternoon, the helicopters changed direction and headed up the mountain. We had a lot of climbers stranded between Camp 1 and Camp 2. The route between Camp 1 and Base Camp is across huge crevasses, some of which are straddled with aluminium ladders. The earthquake had made that route impassable. We didn't know when the next jolt was coming or how big it might be, so those folks needed to be got out of there and fast. The brave pilots punched through the clouds all afternoon, repatriating climbers and Sherpa with their very changed base camp. And it was a great relief to see old friends and to see that they were well and alive. They were all happy to be back at base camp, but struggling to, to deal with what they were seeing in their new environment. I saw some folks standing in the ruins of what had been their camp, probably contemplating what would have happened if their schedule was a day this way or a day that way. Next day, we decided to trek out of base camp and spent about 10 hours trekking down to a village to regroup and replan. We got our first glimpses of the TV and damage across Nepal, and we were very acutely aware that our Sherpa needed to get home. Over the following couple of days, we meandered down one of the busiest trekking routes in the world, completely alone. And at Lukla, we managed to get a ride down to Kathmandu and get a look at the first damage there as well. I stayed on in Kathmandu for a while, doing some relief work in some of the badly hit villages. It was, a, it was an absolute drop in the ocean compared to what was needed. But it helped shine a spotlight on a rebuilding process that's going to be going on for a very long time to come. So I didn't get to climb Everest, and I haven't completed that seventh summit yet. Climbing mountains is, is a very strange pursuit. It's, it's full of paradoxes. It's fantastic fun, but it's also deadly serious. I experienced a close-knit community suffer some terrible trauma on Everest in 2014 and 2015, but I also saw people exhibit some incredible courage and calm under extreme pressure. Mountaineering, like a lot of things in life, is a balance of perceived risk versus real danger. And wandering into extreme altitude is dangerous and irrational. But the human condition is not always rational. And risk is essential in fostering a sense of adventure and curiosity. But with risk comes fear. And one of the best ways to combat fear in the mountain is to be prepared for the expected and armed for the unexpected. In 1953, Hillary and Tenzing set up their camps on slopes that nobody had ever stood on before, not knowing if the entire ground would disappear under them in the night. The men and women of base camp in 2015 swapped one mission for a very, very different one, not knowing if things would get better or much, much worse. We're all fearful sometimes. You cannot be brave or courageous without fear. And it's important to remember that going beyond your fear does not mean being fearless. Sometimes it means being dogged, being determined, and being prepared to take on your fears and to challenge the unexpected. Thank you.